It has been almost a year and a half since Russian forces crossed into Ukraine. But that is not when the story of this war began. From the Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014 to alleged promises and betrayals all the way back at the end of the Cold War, who is to blame and what was the trigger differs depending on who you ask. What is clear is that the ongoing conflict is a grueling one and it's taking a horrible toll on Ukrainian civilians. Our guest on this episode is an American diplomat who served under George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump as a former U.S. ambassador to NATO and special representative for Ukraine, Kurt Volker was involved in events that shaped this war and is perfectly placed to give us his unique perspective on where it's going. Up next, Kurt Volker talks to the interview. Kurt Volker is the former U.S. ambassador to NATO and former special representative for Ukraine negotiations in the Trump administration. He joins us now from Washington, D.C. Good to have you on the interview. How are you doing? I'm very good. Thank you very much. How are you? Okay. All good. All good. Happy to talk to you. Uh, when we look at Ukraine, uh, when we look at where we are at in this horrible conflict, is it going to take a political solution or is it really going to come down to ultimately who wins or loses on the battlefield? Yeah, well, a political solution will follow a military solution. Right now, uh, Vladimir Putin is determined to fight. He wants to eliminate Ukraine, take over its territory, deny Ukrainian sense of national identity. He's not going to succeed at that, but he is committed to the effort. And so as long as he's in power, he's going to keep fighting. Ukrainians are defending their homes, their lives, their families, their territory. They are succeeding slowly, and they will continue to defend themselves. I think it'll take Ukraine defeating Russian forces on the battlefield of Ukraine uh, to create the beginning of an end to the war. And then once the Russian forces are defeated, I think that will cause some political changes in Russia, and that will create the opportunity for there finally to be a settlement to the war. What is the likelihood of stalemate or a sense of quagmire that might see this end up being a Vietnam or Afghanistan type situation that not only rolls on for years, but maybe even decades? Yeah, I would say there's no chance of that. Uh, the Ukrainians will not settle for that. The Ukrainians don't want to leave their people behind. They don't want to leave them in occupied territory facing all kinds of war crimes, abductions, killings, uh, torture, they're, they're going to stop that. So the Ukrainians will not allow a quagmire to exist. They will continue to try to take the territory back. The Wagner Group versus Putin. Fascinating. Well, I mean, it's, it's horrible, but fascinating as well, a sort of subplot of this conflict. Yeah. Your take on it and how it ended. Yeah, so it is fascinating, uh, and it's it's right of you to bring it up because it is an example. It is a um, a manifestation of the contradictions that Vladimir Putin has created. He has staked out a military campaign based on unachievable goals, eliminating Ukraine as a national identity. He has thrown more and more people and material into the fight including building up the Wagner Group, giving them money, giving them arms, letting them fight. And that has then produced an effort to then take down the Putin regime, or at least the Ministry of Defense, because they saw what Putin was doing was unobtainable. So it created these contradictions, and that is just a manifestation of the problem that Putin has created. Uh, I don't think that this is the end of it. I, I don't think that we have seen the last of Prigozhin. I, I think what he said as he was attacking Moscow, that the war was a mistake, that the casualties are far too high, that the conditions of the soldiers are unacceptable. All those things are true, and everybody knew it. So this has somewhat now popped the bubble on Putin's myth about what this war really is. He says it's a special military operation, and he thinks everything is going fine. But the people in Russia know that's not true. 
And so while the Wagner rebellion is over, the, the breaking of the myth of Putin's war, that is now permanent, that no one now believes what Putin is saying. There was an Economist headline that called Prigozhin the abominable showman. Was, he is a fascinating character injected into this. He came close to, I mean, maybe it would have been a coup, who knows, but he didn't succeed and some sort of deal was struck, ended up in Belarus. Is he a dead man walking? Well, first off, we don't know where he is. Mm. Uh, the story is True. that he is True. in Belarus, but no one has seen him. And if I were him, <laughs> I would not set foot in Belarus because that would be the most dangerous place to be, is to be, to be known your location and to be targeted somewhere. And yes, I do think that it is on Putin's list to kill Prigozhin. Uh, Putin uh, governs the country as a mafia lord would do. Uh, and that means that the perception of power is everything. Prigozhin punctured that perception of power. He made Putin look weak. And as a result of that, Putin cannot sit still and allow that to happen. He has to go after Prigozhin in order to preserve the image of his own power. And I think that, therefore, Prigozhin is targeted, and I think, therefore, he is in hiding and plotting his next move as to when he can reemerge. The news that came out a couple of months ago from the Pentagon leaks that suggested that special forces, U.S. special forces, U.K. special forces, French, some Latvian, and one Dutch special forces person, <laughs> that was fascinating, um, they are on the ground operating in Ukraine. Firstly, do you think it's well, true? I mean, I, I'm assuming it's true. From, it came from those Pentagon documents. And is it a good thing? Well, uh, so first off, uh, w we have to be careful what we say when, we, OK, there are special forces operating in Ukraine. What does actually that mean? Um, I, there are no US government run special forces fighting on the front lines in Ukraine. Or that we've been told, and, that we've been told of. <laughs> No, no, no. I, I, I am quite confident. I am quite confident because it is a political priority of the Biden administration to keep the U.S. out of direct fighting in the war. So what are those special forces on the ground doing? Uh, they are probably advising the Ukrainians. They are gathering intelligence. They are operating out of the U.S. embassy. Uh, and I, I, frankly, I think that is very reassuring to know that the United States has its own eyes and ears on the ground, that we're not just taking the reports from the media or we're not just taking them from the Ukrainians, but we are observing ourselves what's happening. So I think that is very reassuring, actually. If they uh, are fighting, if they are fighting, it's illegal, isn't it? Well, it would be contrary to the U.S. policy, which is mm. to stay out of it. So, yes, it would be contrary to U.S. policy. You know, it's a war. So I'm not sure where the lines are when you say is it legal or illegal. Um, Russia's invasion is illegal. Well, I guess the, from, the perspective of, from the perspective of it's a... You haven't declared war, but you're warring on the ground, but claiming that you're not. That's, that's the uh, sort of way of looking at it. I, yeah. So uh, if you look at it from a U.S. Uh, legal point of view, mm. um, the, the, the whole war in Vietnam was conducted by the U.S. government, the, the U.S. administration under, uh, under Lyndon Johnson and under Richard Nixon um, as a what they call a police operation. It was not authorized by Congress uh, uh, as war. And so, yes, you can do that. The, the chief, the, the, the commander in chief, the president, has the authority to direct U.S. military forces. The Congress has the power to declare war. And in between, there's gray zone where the president can use some forces for some military action, but ultimately can't go all the way to declare war. What we're talking about in Ukraine, uh, a few special forces that are gathering intelligence and advising the Ukrainians and advising the U.S. government, that is far from that situation. Mm -hmm. As we step back and tap into your biography, your experience. You were in, on many occasions in the room where it happened, but I don't want to really uh, <laughs> plagiarize that from John Bolton, who I think exactly, took it from yeah. Hamilton as well. Um, could, could you see this coming over the years? Was there an inevitability well, to it from your perspective? 
Well, so I think an important thing for people to remember uh, and for your viewers to remember is that the war of Russia against Ukraine did not start in 2022. It started in 2014. Russia had recognized Ukraine's borders, its international borders, its sovereignty, its territory from 1991 all the way up until 2014. In 2014, it attacked Ukraine, it seized Crimea, and it seized part of eastern Ukraine, a, a part of a region called Donbas. And that, that effort continued. So when I was the special representative for Ukraine negotiations, which was 2017 to 2019, there was fighting every week. Ukrainian soldiers were being killed by Russians every week. And so this was not some kind of frozen, forgotten conflict. It was a hot war going on at the time. So what we saw in 2022 was just a major escalation of the violence, not something new. And I think that's very important to pe for people to remember that this has been something that Vladimir Putin and Russia have been doing for years, not just since February of 22. So why did deterrence fail then? I think uh, the perception in Vladimir Putin's mind was that the U.S., partic uh, particularly the U.S., also NATO, did not have the will to fight and help Ukraine defend itself. After the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, where the United States was not even sending its own forces to go rescue American citizens that were stranded in the capital, I think Vladimir Putin concluded that there's no will to fight and therefore he could get away with a much bigger escalation. So he tested it, he did a major military exercise, which had zero response from the West, and, and that was in uh, spring of 2021. And so by the fall of 21, after the fall of Afghanistan, he said, okay, I can do this. And he did it again, again, no direct serious response, and then he just went ahead with the invasion. It was a miscalculation on his part, uh, because there was a will to help defend uh, Ukraine, to help the Ukrainians uh, with equipment, to, to give them training, to let them defend themselves. And Putin was wrong about that. But his calculation was that no one would help. Is it a serious concern, from your perspective, given all your experience, that he would dare to go for a nation like Sweden, and that's why they need to be a part of NATO? Uh, so... I would flip it around. Um, it's not NATO going out and saying, hey, Sweden, we want you. It's Sweden saying, we want to be part of NATO. And the reason the Swedes are saying that is they saw what Russia did in Ukraine. Here's a lar the largest country geographically in Europe, a country of 40 million people. You know, Sweden's got about 10 million people. And Russia attacks them. They commit brutal war crimes. They, they rape, they torture, they slaughter, they execute. And the Swedes are looking at that and saying, it is not safe to be out here on our own. We need to be part of a defensive alliance, like Turkey is, like Germany is, like Poland is. The Swedes are saying, okay, we need to be part of that now too. Breaking with 200 years of tradition in order to do that, but that's the conclusion the Swedes came to. And I think that the Swedes are making the right calculation. NATO is the only thing that has created security in Europe in, you know, in history. If you look at European history, it is a history of war. And the only thing that has prevented war is a defensive alliance such as NATO, where everyone knows attacking NATO is going to cause your own destruction. And how do you feel about a country such as Turkey that is a part of the defensive alliance, but is still trying to take a more measured approach and maintain relations with both sides and facilitate something like the grain deal. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I have several thoughts on, on Turkey. So uh, I, may, I may speak at length here, I apologize. But first off, Turkey is a very valued member of NATO, uh, along with other countries like Germany and Italy and so forth. But Turkey is critically important. Turkey occupies a geography uh, facing Iran, Iraq, Russia, the Black Sea, Syria, the Middle East, the Mediterranean, that is critically important to the security of Europe. So Turkey is a vital member of NATO. Um, Turkey also has a very valid point when it comes to uh, concerns about terrorism. And the United States, of course, was you know, attacked on September 11th, 2001. Um, we fought terrorism. 
We probably did it in ways that Turkey did not agree with, but that doesn't mean that Turkey and the United States do not share an understanding of what terrorism is and the fact that we have to stop it. So we have to take it very seriously. Now, concerning Sweden and Swedish uh, NATO membership, uh, I think that Turkey has made a point uh, and Sweden responded to that point, uh, which is that Sweden was too lax in allowing the PKK to organize and fundraise and conduct propaganda activities inside Sweden. And they've changed their policy on this and they've amended their constitution. And I think that Turkey was right to do so. And I think now it is right for Turkey to agree to Swedish NATO membership because Sweden has recognized Turkey's point on this. Now, as far as Ukraine goes, uh, I think that uh, Turkey has for centuries had an issue of trying to contain Russia, prevent it from free access to the Mediterranean through the Straits, and at the same time to work with Russia because it's a very large, very powerful neighbor. And I think Turkey has tried to keep that balance. Russia has upset the balance, not Turkey. Russia has upset the balance by attacking Ukraine, by seizing Crimea, by seizing other parts of Ukraine, and by continuing this war. And I think Turkey is now in a situation where it actually has to support Ukraine against Russia to restore the balance that Russia has upset. And here, I think the, the Turkish statements about Crimea and about Crimea being returned to its rightful owners are very important and exactly the right thing to do. And the one thing I would ask and, and look for Turkey to do is to support freedom of navigation in the Black Sea. Uh, I find it unacceptable that the United Nations has agreed that Russia has a right to block international shipping, uh, third party vessels with commercial goods sailing in international waters are threatened by Russia with military attack. And I find that to be completely unacceptable. And I would hope that Turkey also would agree that shipping should proceed normally. Third party vessels, international waters, commercial goods should be able to pass freely in the Black Sea. That has more to do with the fact that Russia has a permanent seat on the Security Council than any other nation's policy, doesn't it? No, not at all. I, I don't see the Security Council having any role in this. Uh, I think that uh, it is the, Turkey's rights and Turkey's responsibilities under the Montreux Convention uh, to assure freedom of passage through the Straits of the Bosphorus. And I think that Russia is blocking the UN Security Council from taking any action. But because the UN Security Council is blocked, it is not playing any role. Over the years, have you become partial in any way, shape or form to any of the Russian arguments of encroachment? NATO is at our doorstep. It's coming for us. It's adding more and more members to its eastern wing. I mean, they would have seen you, Kurt Volker, as US ambassador to NATO, as US ambassador to himself. I mean, it's one and the same thing to the, <laughs> to the Russians, right? So have you grown partial to any of their arguments, historical or otherwise, over the years? No, no, I haven't, because the Russian arguments fundamentally are all about their claiming to have a say over other people. So you have people who live in Poland, people who live in Estonia, people who live in Slovakia, who basically had been occupied by the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union during the Cold War. They got their freedom, and their position is never again. I don't want to be occupied by Russia again. We have to prevent that from happening. So those people are making their own free choices to join an alliance, just as Turkey has done, to join an alliance to say, let us all work together to protect ourselves collectively. Uh, that's what that's about. Russia continues to insist that it has a right to decide the lives of other people. And I simply don't accept that. How ugly can this get? What is the extent of existential fear, especially when it comes to the nuclear word? If mm. Putin has an end game where he wants to win in Ukraine at all costs, Ukraine fighting to the death, NATO in the background, could it get extremely diabolically ugly? Well, Let's not underestimate how ugly it is already. Mm. Uh, if you look at what Russia has done in Ukraine, the 
the the execution of civilians, you know, hands tied behind their backs, shot in the streets, the the targeting of maternity hospitals, the abduction of children to bring them back to Russia and indoctrinate them as Russian citizens to to stop them from from perceiving themselves as Ukrainian. This is genocide, and this is absolutely appalling. That is already enough to be concerned about. Now, concerning the possible use of nuclear weapons, it would be terrible. Of course, any use of nuclear weapons would be catastrophic. I don't believe that Russia will do it because I don't think it achieves their objectives. Uh, and this is, this is important because if it did achieve their objectives, I think Russia is fully capable of using a nuclear weapon against unarmed civilians. Of course, they would do it. But the fact is, it doesn't advance their their uh, forces on the battlefield. It doesn't defeat Ukraine as a concept, and it invites pressure back against Russia, including direct military pressure, uh, if they were to use a nuclear weapon. Can I get slightly personal here? <laughs> sure. Um, you were deposed 2019. You gave evidence at the impeachment hearings. I'm not here to litigate, I'm not MSNBC, I'm not here to litigate it or relitigate it or investigate it or anything. I mean, under the Trump administration, the idea, the claim was that Trump was using senior officials such as yourself to go and push Zelensky to dig up dirt on Biden in exchange for military aid. That was the claim. You know, this was all discussed and investigated. I wanna ask you about that whole mess's impact on you as a person and your career. Right. Well, uh, so several things about that. First off, uh, I was very happy with the role that I had played on Ukraine because we had provided tremendous support for Ukraine, even though you had statements from the president that were solicitous of Vladimir Putin. The reality is that we, we shut down the Russian consulate in San Francisco. We lifted the arms embargo on Ukraine. We provided them with Javelin anti-tank systems and anti-sniper systems. And I think those systems proved their value in February of 22, when the Russians attacked Kyiv, the Ukrainians were able actually to respond and to defend themselves. So I think we did a lot of good work at that time. Now, what happened in the US domestic politics is the Congress decided to impeach the president uh, and they started a process of doing that. And as the central figure dealing with Ukraine and Ukraine being the subject, it became impossible to continue doing the same job. The Russians would not take me seriously if I'm having to be in the center of a po domestic political discussion in the United States and trying to deal with Russia at the same time internationally. It would not have worked. So uh, it only made sense to step down to testify in the Congress and to clear things up. Four years on, you have not, at least according to my knowledge, officially taken any pol uh, political position. You've not jumped back into politics. So did it sour it for you? Have you decided you're done with that? No. no well, quite the opposite. I, <clears throat> if you go back, I never <laughs> did that even before. So I've, I've never been involved in domestic politics in the U.S., uh, I care about national security, I care about foreign policy, and my, my fundamental set of issues that I care about is the, the way people deal with government in the world, that people have a right to be free, they have a right to take care of their families, to build their own prosperity, and to be safe doing so. And so that set of issues, how do you build prosperity, democracy, security in the world through alliances, through uh, working together with people who share those same values. That's what I've always been about. And that's not a domestic political issue in the United mm. States. It's not a partisan issue. It's, it's something bigger. But I guess, I mean, the point I'm making is that you're not ambassador to any, anywhere right now. Are you, are you happy to be in this position oh. that you're in now, trying to, I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure whether you feel it's better to be on the outside in that respect now? Well, I, I do right now because... Uh, when I look at the, uh, the current administration, I look at the Trump administration as it played out, I think about a future administration, I feel as though I have more of my own voice right now than I would if I was inside some other administration but not able to really make a difference. 
Okay, one final piece of housekeeping. I know that you were involved in the Balkans with, with Bosnia under the late Richard Holbrook yeah. two and a half decades ago. Uh, things were flaring up in Kosovo recently. We know that when things flare up in the Balkans, sometimes world wars happen as well. Are you concerned about the Balkans at all? Yes, very much. Mm. Uh, I think, uh, and I'm glad you asked this question because I think it is underreported. I, I think that we have a problem with Serbian nationalism fueled by Russia that is largely going unchecked, and it is undermining the sovereignty and undermining politics in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in Montenegro, to a lesser degree in Macedonia. And what we have tried to do, the United States and the European Union particularly, what we have tried to do is work with Serbia in order to encourage them to be part of a, uh, a responsible international community. The fact is that Serbia has taken advantage of that to push its nationalist agenda at the expense of other countries. I think we need to actually do some course correction here, mm -hmm. work with our friends and allies who are committed to democracy, to multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious societies that are going to be part of a democratic Europe and to put some fences around, uh, around Serbia until they come to the conclusion that they need to act like everybody else. Okay, well, I'm glad I got your thoughts on all these issues. Kurt Volker, a pleasure having you on the interview. Thank you very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you.